If you have your Bibles, turn with me. We're going to be in the book of Revelation this morning. We are in the 16th chapter. We're going to be finishing off uh, chapter 16. Uh, We've been in the book of Revelation now for about a year. And uh, as you know all too well, here at Denver Calvary, we go book by book. We go chapter by chapter. We'll go verse by verse. And this morning, we're going to be finishing off chapter 16, looking specifically at verses 12 all the way down to verse 21. And we're going to be looking at the final bold judgment. So what I like to do is for us just to read our text together. Let's read it, get familiar with it, and then we'll come back, expound it, and look at that together. It says in Revelation 16, starting in verse 12, it says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs that came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and uh, of the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming quickly as a thief, and blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together at the place in Hebrew called Armageddon. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven and from the throne saying, it is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since the men, since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts and the city, cities of the nations fell and great Babylon was remembered before God to give, up, uh, to give her up the cup of the wine and the fierceness of God's wrath. And every island fled away and the mountains they were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon uh, every man, every, every hailstone, the weight of uh, a talent, around 70 to 100 pounds, And men blaspheme God because of the plagues of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. I don't know about you, but after you read that, it's like, I think we need to pray again. So listen, (laughs) you you read that and you think, oh man, there's a heaviness. Remember guys, for the last, I can't say how long, we've been talking about the wrath of God, the judgments of God. It's not the pastor's favorite topic of sermon, sermons, right? The wrath of God, the judgment of God, the fierceness of God, the holiness of God, the justice of God. And what we're doing here is we're looking at the final stages of this timeline known as the tribulational period. It's a seven-year period. In the middle of that period, the Antichrist is gonna break this promise, this covenant that he makes with the nation of Israel. And from that time of the covenant being broken to the great day of the Lord is known as the time of great tribulation or in the Old Testament, it's known as time of Jacob's trouble. And that's what we're looking at now. And it's just after these bold judgments are completed, done and finalized that finally we arrive at the moment of this whole, the climax of all this. And that is the great day of the Lord. That's when Jesus Christ comes back with 10,000s of his saints. And here's the thing that we need to realize is that when Jesus comes back, it's gonna be much different than anything we can imagine. When Jesus comes back, it's gonna be much different than what we have ever pictured Jesus as before. I mean, how many guys, anybody here ever grow up with like a velvet Jesus on the wall? Anybody here? Anybody go, go over to your grandma's house? So I, my, my grandparents were Catholic, so I would go over to their house and they would have the velvet Jesus on the wall. Now, sometimes you would, see, you would see that. Some of you guys might have the surfer Jesus. He's like the white guy, blue eyes, like long surf hair with the really cool beard. And he's like, you know, he's not really doing that. But, but you get this picture of Jesus, meek and mild, look on this little child, and you think of the suffering servant, the Jesus that we know, but... The Christ that comes back in Revelation 19 is gonna be much, much different. Why? Because he is gonna come back in full glory. He's gonna come back as the King of Kings. He's gonna come back as God Almighty in the flesh. And it's interesting because we, throughout scripture, we get a little taste of, of Jesus in glory. We get a little bit of a picture of what he will be like in glory. Remember when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw, I would say, a part 
of the glory of Christ. They were blown away. And who was up with him on the mountain? You guys remember? Mo and Eli, right? Moses and Elijah, which many believe those are going to be the two witnesses that we studied back in Revelation chapter 11. So what will Jesus be like? Hold your spot there, Revelation 16. Do you turn to your left, Revelation chapter one. You gotta see this for yourself. Why? Because it's frightful. It's amazing. It's powerful. The description that we're given of Jesus in glory, we read here in Revelation chapter one, starting in verse 13, John is, for the first time, this vision is being revealed, and he sees Jesus, and it says in verse 13, and in the midst of the seven lampstand, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, girded about the chest with a golden band, and his head and his hair were like white. They were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice was the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the countenance of the sun, shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at my feet as dead, and he laid on his, hand on my right, on his right hand on me, and he said, do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last. I am he who lives was dead, and behold, I am alive forever. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. And write these things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after that. Listen, if you saw this Jesus, you would fall on your knees before him. He is coming back, swords flying out of his mouth, eyes with flames of fire. Why? Because he is coming back as a ruler, as a king, as God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. It's a much different Jesus than we've ever seen that we could ever quite imagine. But before he comes, we know in our text and we know in this timeline of tribulation that there are gonna be these final judgments of God. Judgments that are coming upon the earth for unbelief. Judgment falling upon the earth because of sin and rebellion. God has given mankind every opportunity to respond. The gospel's gone forth, and now these judgments must be complete. Now, last week, we looked at chapter 16, those first 11 verses or so, and we looked at the first five bold judgments. The first was judgment on all men with swords that came about them, festering swords. The second bold judgment was judgment on the ocean and on the seas, the ecology of the earth, where they were turned to blood. The third bold judgment was judgment upon the fresh water and the springs where they also were plagued with blood as well. The fourth bold judgment was on the sun, that there is a cataclysmic event with the sun. Something happens with the sun where now it begins to scorch the world, earth, and mankind with fire. The fifth one that we looked at last week was darkness, that the earth would be plagued with great darkness causing men to gnash at their teeth. And so this morning, we're gonna be finishing off the sixth and the seventh bowl um, this morning. Verse 12, it reads and says, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. Down in verse 16, it says, and they gathered them together at the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Now, this section here, verses 12 through 16, identifies a monumental moment and battle that is going to take place. Now, again, we know as we've been studying the book of Revelation that there's a number of ways in which uh, eschatology can be interpreted. There's different perspectives. There's a historical narrative of interpretation of eschatology. There is a preterist style view of eschatology. There is a futurist style view of eschatology. And for us, that would be kind of the realm we look at. These are future events. And for us, we take this literal. We take a literal interpretation of the, of the Bible and the book of Revelation. And when it talks about this gathering of these armies at this place called Armageddon, we literally believe there will be a battle and a war that takes place there. 
Again, this is where that famous word, famous term that is used for all sorts of movies, right? Armageddon, the end of all things. It comes straight from the word of God. Now that name, Armageddon, is significant. It's important we understand what that means. It actually comes from two Hebrew words, the word har, H-A-R, and the word megiddo or megiddo. The word har means a hill and megiddo quite literally just simply means the place of troops or the place of slaughter. That's, that's where we know where this will take place. In fact, people ask the question, well, where will the great battle of Armageddon take place? Well, the Bible does not give us an exact location. It only gives us this name. It gives us a river. It gives us a few of these, these geographical locations that are literal locations. And because of that, we can estimate and have a really good biblical uh, understanding of where this might take place place. In fact, many believe based on the name itself, uh, Armageddon, Harmageddon, uh, that this actually will take place in what's known as the Plains of Estrelon, or also known, more vividly known as the Valley of Jezreel. This area is about a 14 mile wide by 20 mile long area, famous for great battles throughout world history. There's been at least 200 battles that we know are, that have been documented and recorded in this giant valley, the Valley of Jezreel. In fact, Napoleon himself called this place the most natural battlefield in the whole earth. And when you're there in Israel and you're there standing on Mount Carmel, just due south uh, west of Megiddo, you see this massive valley. In fact, we got a picture we'll put up because we were just in Israel. So that's a picture I took standing on Mount Carmel last month when we took our team from Denver Calvary to Israel. And as far as the eye can see, this giant stretch is known as the Valley of Jezreel. There's another photo we'll put up there of our group. That actually, where we are standing there, is we're actually standing on Tel Megiddo, the hill in Megiddo. There's this large mound, they call it a hill or a, a, a hill. It's actually just a, like a little, it's a little small hill, but a, a castles and, and fortresses were built there, thousands of years old. And it's there in the plains of Je Jezreel that many believe this actually is gonna take place. This huge battle. Again, as I mentioned before, there's been other historic uh, significant attacks, battles, uh, defeats that have taken place here. Just scripturally alone, uh, Barak defeated the armies of Canaan there, Judges 5. Gideon fought the Midianites there, Judges 7. King Saul died there in battle with his son Jonathan, 1 Samuel 31. Titus and the Romans, and on 70 AD, they came here with their armies on the way to Jerusalem to seize it around 70 AD. More modern warfare, the British general Allenby used it to defeat the Turks in 1917. And it's here that we read this section of scripture in Revelation 16, verses 12 through 16, as this six bowl judgment is being poured out. It's to make the way ready for this giant battle, this war called the Battle of Armageddon. Now we read there in verse 12 specifically, it says that the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Now that river Euphrates, it should ring a bell to you. You should remember it because as we study the book of Revelation, we've actually read about this river before, this place called the river Euphrates. It's known as a great river. Why? Because it is the longest river in all of the, uh, the Asia, the Western Asia area. It's some 1,800 miles long. And it's actually one of the most important rivers in all of Western Asia. It's there that we read that this angel who receives the seven bowl of God's judgment goes to this area, this geographical area, and literally pours this bowl out. And now there is this judgment that comes upon it. And what happens is that this giant river, this giant resource is completely dried up. It's dried up. Now, as we've been studying already, we know that the oceans have been polluted by God's judgment. The rivers and springs have been polluted by God's judgment. And then we see that this river system is completely dried up for a very important reason. Why? We read in verse 12. So that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. 
the kings of the east. So here's a question. Who are these kings of the east? We're not given any, any other titles other than that, these kings of the east. We'll read about them a little bit more, study more about them in Revelation 17 and chapter 18. But it's a question that many have asked. You know, who are these kings? And so many believe these to be those of the eastern nations east of the great river Euphrates. You think about the, all the, the countries that, that would exist along that uh, eastern border there. We have Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, China, along with many other nations. But here's what we know. They leave the east. They make their way west to go to Palestine, to go to Israel, to go to Jerusalem. But here's the question that we really don't know the answer to. What, what makes them come? What draws them to this place called Armageddon. What brings them at this moment in time? We're not very sure. Some would articulate and speculate, well, maybe they're standing against the Antichrist. Maybe they're tired of his leadership and, and all the plagues of God, so they're coming, coming, coming against him, but that doesn't quite make sense. Well, many believe, and I probably would support this more so, is that these kings of the East are coming to come against Israel, to stand against the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel becomes a thorn in the flesh against the world, against the Antichrist, against this religious system that he is setting up. But we're really not sure. Here's what we do know, though. When they come, we know that they are going to ultimately stand against God. We know ultimately they will stand against Christ. That's what the scripture says. That's what the, the rest of Revelation will speak of, which we'll talk about more of this battle of Armageddon down the road. Now, here's the thing. Although we may not truly be sure what gathers these nations and these armies, drawing them together and move them west, here's what we do know that it is a political war. We know it's a religious war. We know what's underlining behind it and what's underlining behind it will stop and think. Who's behind all the things taking place up to this point in the book of Revelation here on earth? Who has his hand as the master puppet working with this individual called the beast, also called the Antichrist? Who's the one kind of pulling the strings for this, this guy that, that we call the false prophet that creates this religious system? We know. It's Satan. It is demonically inspired. It's, it's come straight from the pit of hell. There's demons at work. In fact, that's what it says in verse 13, if you look at it with me. <clears throat> it says, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So we see that these kings are coming from the east to the west, to this area of Jerusalem, to this, this valley of Jezreel for this great battle. And we ask, well, why are they coming? Well, now we know the answer. It's demonically inspired. They're working behind the scenes. They're using mankind to seek to stand against God. Now we read in verse 13, man, this is like something out of like a horror movie, right? We get this imagery and this, there is symbolism here. Though we take a literal interpretation of the book of Revelation, we also realize that John is seeing, has a picture of this vision, and he's doing the best he can to explain what he's seeing and writing down. And what's he see? It says in verse 13, and I saw three unclean spirits. That's pretty plain. We understand that, these demonic entities. But it says that they look like frogs. And they're coming out of the mouth of the dragon out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now we have the source. Now again, we look at the dragon and we know who the dragon is, right? The dragon is Satan. We know that clearly, Revelation chapter 12. The beast is clearly identified, Revelation chapter 13, as the Antichrist. The false prophet is clearly identified there along with the beast there in Revelation chapter 13 as well. And we see the source, these demonic spirits, and they're like these frogs that come out. Anybody here like frogs? Frogs are gross. I don't like frogs. I remember I, I, I brought home a frog one time going to camp. My mom freaked out. It wasn't just a frog, it was a toad. It was bigger than my hand. I found him, I named him Boomerang, I stuck him in my bag and I brought him home. 
And my mom said, no way. <laughs> so I had to release him to the wild. I don't know if he made it, but I pray to this day that that boomerang made it. But frogs are gross. They smell funny. They look weird. They have warts. They're not something pleasant. And we see here that these demons that come out of the mouth of these three entities, it says that they have their spirits like frogs. And again, where do they come out? Out of the mouth of Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet. That has meaning, guys. When it says it comes out of their mouth, quite literally, it says that it's by their authority, it's by their words, it's by their, their language and, and verbal ability that they're gonna have authority and influence and say. And that's what we've studied so far. Not only are they gonna have say, we read here in verse 14 that these demonic spirits here, that they're gonna perform signs and wonders and they're going to go out to the kings of the earth. Listen, Satan is not something we have to be afraid of. This, this past week on Wednesday night, we talked a little bit uh, on Wednesday nights about demonic forces and spirits and entities, and, and they exist. They're just fallen angels. That's what the Bible tells us. And there are too many that are afraid of the spiritual realm, and they live in fear of demons and Satan. And the reality is this. We don't really have to be afraid. If you're a believer in Christ, you're born again. We don't have to be afraid. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. Christians can't be demon-possessed because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that we can't be attacked or threatened. It doesn't mean that we can't be oppressed by, by the enemy. But that's all they did. That's all they can do. Now here, these demonic entities are gonna have power and authority. We know that. God's gonna grant the Antichrist power and authority. And we see here that they specifically are gonna influence the kings of the earth. And what are they gonna do? They're gonna draw them to this place of battle against God and against Christ. Now, this is why we read that Psalm this morning. We read Psalm 2. And Psalm 2 is not only a messianic Psalm, it's a prophetic Psalm, eschatological uh, Psalm as well. We read in Psalm 2, verse one and two, it says, why do the nations rage? Why do the people plot a vain thing? Because the kings of the earth, they set themselves or they take their stand. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. You know what that's speaking of? Right here, Revelation 16. They think they're gonna be able to stand against Christ, to stand against God and do battle and war against him. How foolish is that? Here's the thing to understand though. You think, why would anybody think that way? Sin will harden and blind the eyes and the mind and the heart of all mankind if they, if they give in to that, if they give in, give in to the hardness of their heart. You guys remember Pharaoh? When Pharaoh stood against God, when Moses wanted to, the people to be released, God said, hey, go to, go to Pharaoh, go to Egypt and ask for my people to be released. We read there that Pharaoh hardened his heart. If you remember that, you recall that. It's interesting because in, in, in Romans chapter 9, we have a little extra uh, information there. We read that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But it's interesting because when you read the language there, it says that God hardened that which was already hard. God gave them over to this debased mind. And that's what's going to happen here. That they're going to think they're going to stand against God. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself but I want to include a little section here in Revelation chapter 17. Look at verse 12 through 14 that speaks about this moment. It says in uh, Revelation 17, verse 12, it says, And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. And these are one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. And these will make war with the lamb. And the lamb will overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and he is the king of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Amen. So we look at this section, guys. The sixth bowl is a judgment that God is gonna pour out it will dry up this river, the river Euphrates, that runs from, you know, I think just north of Turkey, uh, even might even be in the Ukraine. Uh, it's a few other rivers. They come together, form the great Euphrates, and it forms this line down from there to Turkey, Afghanistan, Iran. It kind of goes down right through those, and it separates this, this geographical location where these kings of the earth are going to come. And again, this reminds us, this tells us what this is all about. They're here to stand against God. 
And what does Jesus remind us in this with this great battle that's gonna be taking place? He says in verse 15, in light of this, John, in light of this revelation, what you've seen, this battle that's about to take place, he says in verse 15, 15 he, gives a, he gives a warning. He says, behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather together to the place in Hebrew that's called our Megiddo. Jesus once again reminds John. Remember guys, this is the revelation of Jesus to the church. He gave this revelation to John to give the church so the churches could read this and be encouraged to keep their eyes fixed on Christ. It's the revelation of Jesus, not the Antichrist, not the false prophet, not the battle of Armageddon. Though those things take place in this revelation, it's about Jesus. And what I love about this section is once again, every now and then, Jesus has to remind John with this revelation, hey, don't forget, it's about me. Don't forget, I'm coming back. Don't forget, he says, guys, hey, behold, I'm coming as a thief. Find that interesting. Sometimes people uh, get upset if there's a worship song that uses a negative. Jesus describes himself as what? A thief. Because he's trying to communicate an idea and a thought that he wants us to grasp. And a thief is someone or a burglar, someone that comes at a time you do not expect. They're coming at an hour that you're unaware. They come quickly. They come suddenly. We're told in Revelation 22, 7, Jesus says, behold, I come quickly. Now there's a mindset that from the time of the resurrection till now, that Jesus has wanted the church to, to, to be instilled in his church. And it's this mindset that Christ can come any moment. For you and I, we await the rapture. We believe that there will be a literal rapture of the church and that he will take us prior to this time of tribulation. Theologically, eschatology, that's kind of where we stand as a church. But this idea from the time of the resurrection, all throughout the early church, throughout church history, history up to the present, there's this idea of, hey guys, Jesus is coming soon. Hey, Jesus is coming quickly. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Now here's the problem that so many have. Oh man, I've heard that before. They've been saying that for years, for hundreds of years, thousands of years, Jesus is coming back. In fact, in Peter, it talks about, there's this verse that talks about that Jesus is slow in keeping his promise, but that's not the case. See, Jesus wants you and me today to live with the idea and the thought and the intent that he can come tomorrow. That it's short, that it's quick in the eyes of God, the heart of God. You see, and depending on if something is soon or something is short, it changes the way that you live. It radically changes your thinking. It changes your desires and also changes your actions and your behavior. If you're gonna have a baby very soon, listen, you're not gonna go skydiving. Am I right, right? It's not gonna happen. You're not gonna be out there, how, how many months are you? I'm seven months. Yeah, I'm gonna go do some skydive. That's not gonna happen. Why? Because you're anticipating this in a very important moment. Everything else becomes secondary. That becomes first and foremost. Same is true if you know you're gonna die. There are those that I know, we have friends, my wife and I as a friend, Maureen Schaefer, we flew her out here last year for the women's retreat. Her and her husband, John, we have known, my wife has known since we were little kids. My father-in-law married them. They've been doing ministry for 30-something years and she has cancer and it's a little eating her away and she's gonna die sooner than later. And you know when it says that death is coming, we don't know when death is gonna come for her, for Maureen, but here's what we do know. It's coming sooner than later. And you know what that does? It changes the way you think. It changes the way that, what you believe. It changes the way that you live. Every moment now becomes precious and more meaningful, important because the time has to be redeemed. And so when we are made of the end, it changes our perception. And so when we read here that Jesus says, I come back as a thief. In other words, I come quickly. Hey, listen up. He, he gives it with the blessing. He says, blessed is he who watches. You know, in Matthew chapter five, we have the Beatitudes, blessed is, blessed. Oh, how happy is a man. That's the word blessed, that's what it means. Oh, how happy the man that does X, Y, and Z. Jesus says, blessed is the man who watches and keeps himself ready, keeps his garment ready. 
He keeps himself prepared. What this is known in theological terms, this is known as the doctrine of eminence, that Christ is coming at any moment. And I believe that that's how he's asked the church to live, that Christ is coming. Because if you truly believe, if I truly, if we truly believe that he is coming sooner than later, it ought to change how you live with the gospel, with your life in purity and faithfulness and obedience. The early church lived that way and you and I are called to live, live that way and it comes with a blessing. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman who watches. And so the sixth bowl comes, it ends, it's poured out in the great river Euphrates as a gathering of this great battle of Armageddon. But what will the last bowl judgment bring? The last and final bowl and judgment of the wrath of God. I don't know about you, I'm ready for the last one. I'm done. I was one and done a long time ago. Like, just give me the, let's, let's get to the return of Jesus. We got a couple chapters left. But these are the last final bowl judgments. Verse 17. It says, And the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven. From, from, uh, and from the throne saying, it is done. It is finished. It's complete. We, hear, we see here that this final uh, angel comes with the final bowl. And it's interesting because he pours this bowl out and it says it's poured into the air. It's kind of an interesting picture. It's poured into the air. Now, why into the air? Many believe that it has direct reference to Satan. Uh, there's a verse I want to share with you. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. We'll put it up on the screen. <clears throat> it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, and according to the prince of the power of the, what's it say? The air. Specific, specific reference to Satan. He is the one that, that has led us in the course of this world. He is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. And so what many believe is when we're here looking at Revelation 16, 17, this angel that pours out his, this bold judgment in the air, that specifically it's speaking of Satan and his influence that he has had in the spiritual realm. And here we see that God is clearing the air, if you will. God is pouring judgment in the air, this area of dominion and influence. And we see here as well, this loud voice, it comes out of the temple, that's significant. It comes out of heaven. It comes from the throne. It is God himself, and he's saying this, guys, it is done. It's done. It is finished. The exact same word that God uses here is the exact same word Jesus used on the cross. My work is finished. There's a finality to it. It's done. And how will it be finished? Well, it's gonna come with a bang, verse 18. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Again, we get this picture. Again, John's just trying to write this stuff down. He's seeing this. He goes, okay, man, it's loud. It's noise. It's, there's lightning everywhere. There's God's judgment being poured out. The presence of God, the voice of God. That's not the first time we've seen that. We've seen it back in Revelation 8, 5. We saw the seventh seal being, being released. In fact, go back and look at that with me real quick. Revelation chapter 8, verse 5. I want you to see this. It says, and the angel took the censer. He filled it with fire from the altar and he threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquakes. He take this, they throw it to the earth. Now, however, this time in Revelation chapter 16, this final judgment, it says that this is gonna be a great earthquake. Again, that word great is a word that we looked at quite a bit in Revelation because there were many things that are great. It's where we get the English word mega from. It's the Greek word mega. Huge, enormous, oversized. Now, I'm from Southern California. I was talking to someone this morning. They weren't gonna hold that against me. Thank you, brother, for not holding that against me. I've been in Colorado like about 17 years now, 18 years. So this is very much home. I've gone through some blizzards. So I'm almost a Coloradian, right? Almost getting there. But in Southern California, man, if there's one thing I remember as a kid was earthquakes. 
and I hated them. They scared, they scared me to death. Why? Because they came at a time you didn't expect. You'd be sleeping in your bed, it's cozy, it's great, and all of a sudden everything begins to shake in your room. The windows shake and it makes this really loud vibrating noise, a chandelier in the living room, everything, everything on your dresser and counters in the room throughout the whole house, the whole frame of the house begins to shake and you wake up, you jump out of bed and you run to the doorpost and everybody in your family now runs to the doorpost and you're sitting there and you're just, your heart's beating and pounding. And it's interesting because I've been on all kinds of earthquakes. I've had them at night. I remember driving to school, the Great Whittier earthquake in 1985 or six. We were driving to school. That one happened. I remember there was a big earthquake up and, and I was at a youth winter camp. And we're there at camp. And there the bed starts shaking. We jump out of bed. I was on the top bunk, jumped down like Spider-Man. Like, what's going on? Earthquakes, California. I hate them. They're scary. This it says, this earthquake will be so large, so huge, so mega, that the earth has never seen it. The earth has never experienced this. Do you think the earth shook during the flood as water was being released from the sky and water was being released from the earth as mountain ranges were being formed? I believe so. However, here, highways, homes, buildings, trees, structures, they will be toppled completely to the ground. Because in every earthquake I ever experienced, they are completely isolated. Because there's these tectonic plates that shift and move. There's pressure that's formed and they build too much pressure so they have to keep moving. That's what causes the ground to shake. This, however, we shuck because God's judgment on the earth. And the whole earth is going to shake. You just think of a snow globe and you shake that little sucker and all of a sudden, whew, all those, all those little snowflakes go in the air. The earth is going to be shuck, and that's what's going to happen. And what will this earthquake do? Verse 19, it says, Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations, they fell. And great Babylon was rem remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, and every island fled away, and the mountains, they were not found. Once again, we read about this great city, this great quake. Now, specifically here we read in verse 19, this great city that's gonna be shook. Where is this great city? What is this great city? We studied this earlier in the book of Revelation. We believe this to be the, the city of Jerusalem, the great city. That's where the two prophets went and witnessed and were killed there in the great city uh, in Israel. In fact, hold your spot there in Revelation chapter 16. Turn to the Old Testament, Zechariah. In your Old Testament, it's after Joel, after Amos. <clears throat> it's just before Malachi. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. We read of this giant quake and what's going to cause it. It is the judgment of God, but look what it says here. Zechariah 14, verse 1, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil will be divided in your midst for I will gather all the nations to the city that shall be taken. The houses will be rifled, the women ravished, the half, half of the city shall go into captivity but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. That's those Jews that will be saved by God. Verse three, and the Lord, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, he will stand, he will set his foot and stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a large valley. Half of the mountain shall be moved towards the north and half of it shall be to the south. It's a great day of the Lord. This judgment, it'll be split into the great city there in Jerusalem. But not only will this, the city of Jerusalem be split, it says here in verse 19, it says, and great Babylon was remembered. What's great Babylon? We believe great Babylon to be this system that's created by the, the Antichrist, this new world system, this new world empire, if you will. It has a couple names. It goes by the Roman Empire, the Babylonian Empire, and we're going to look at that in depth in chapter 17 and chapter 18, more in depth. And we find here, once again, this giant earthquake, what it's going to do, verse 20 is telling. It's really interesting. 
Again, if we take this literal, what this will look like, it says verse 20, and then every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Why? Because the earthquake's so strong that quite literally it topples everything flat. And what's, what's an island anyways? It's a mountain just with water all around it with the tip sticking up. That's what an island is. It's gonna level everything. It's gonna flatten everything. It's gonna flatten everything except what? The great city of God. That won't be flattened when Jesus sets his foot there. The topography of the earth though, guys, it, won't, it will be a world that we'll never know. It'll be a completely different world from this point moving forward. Just like if we go back and we look at, we read the book, the, the book of Genesis and we study that prior to the flood, it was a different world to post flood. It was a whole, when Noah came out of the ark with his family, it was a different world as he ever knew. And so this final bold judgment will bring noise and thunder and lightning, this great earthquake that the world has never seen. But there's one more aspect of this great judgment, and that's verse 20 and 21. It's, it's pretty insane. Actually, verse 21 says, and great hail fell from heaven upon men and every, every hailstone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. Imagine for this, guys, again, there's, hey, there's this lightning and thunder and giant earthquake, but then there's also this aspect of God's judgment of hail. Some would say brimstone, fire and brimstone that would be falling down on people. Now, when it says here about the weight, it's interesting. Your Bible might have a little tab there. We'll give reference to what this weight is. It says here, uh, a talent. Quite literally what it, what it speaks to when it says weight, it says the weight that a man could carry. That's quite literally interpretation. So what weight can you vary? Well, you know, each of us can carry different amount of weight, right? Jimmy can throw up some 100 pounds of concrete on his shoulders because he's a buff guy, right? But for some of us, you know, 75 pounds might be our max. Maybe for you, throwing a bag of concrete, 120 pounds maybe. Think about that, falling from the sky. as a size of hail. Some would even say, speculate, that that's, you know, when you think of that being, you think of something big and large, well, imagine that's something small and just dense and heavy. It's, just, it's supernatural, supernatural judgment that God brings upon the earth. What will that do to everything after this earthquake? Continue to bring death and destruction. And guys, that's what it's meant to do. It's, it's judgment. God's bringing his judgment. Now you would think after all of this, after all the, the seals, after all the trumpet judgments, after the Antichrist and the death and the mark of the beast. And you would think after all this cataclysmic judgment that God brings and, and, and these bold judgments that those in the world would finally cry out, oh God, just save me. But no, we read at the end of verse 21 as we come to a close. And men blaspheming God because of the hail. Why? Because their hearts were calloused. Their hearts were hardened by their sin and disbelief. They would not believe. They could not believe. They were sold and given over to the enemy. They raised their fist in defiance against God. And that's the bad news. The good news is in the timeline of what we've been studying, what's next in the timeline is the coming of Christ, the great day of the Lord. Now remember, guys, before we jump, before we jump into the great day of the Lord, oftentimes in eschatology, in the study of, of eschatology, we know that it's very Jewish and there's tapestry and imagery. And as the, the timeline is given, we go forward a little bit and it gives us what's gonna take place, but then the author will take us back to review things in the timeline. That's what we're gonna do. In the next a few weeks, we're gonna be in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. We're gonna go back and we're gonna look at this empire, this Babylonian empire that, that's raised up by the Antichrist. But then after that, Jesus comes back. And that's the day we wait, amen? Father, we thank you this morning for our time in the word.